Welcome to Safe and Sound, sponsored by White Mountain Fire and Life Safety and Ladies' Day LLC. Today on the show, we have Dave Reisner, the District Fire Management Officer for the Lakeside Ranger District, and Mary Springer, the Emergency Management Director for Navajo County. Welcome to the show, guys. Hi, Allison. Nice to be here. Yes, I'm going to just get right into it. We've been doing a couple shows, and we've been talking about the RSG program, and both of you guys are actually a part of the RSG program. Um, Dave, one of the things that you do is you talk about the U.S. Forest Service, so let's just jump into the U.S. Forest Service and let our listeners know um, what the forest looks like for the yeah, U.S. Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, my part of the, the program is, is explaining the forest conditions. Uh, I think everybody realizes that uh, we're very deficit in moisture this winter. Um, hardly any snow moisture uh, since January. And uh, that has left us in a condition where we're kind of in between the conditions that we had in 2002 with the Rodeo Chesky fire and in 2011 with the Wallow fire on the uh, Apache side of the National Forest. And we're, we're right in that same uh, uh, fire conditions that we had in those two years. We're feeling that we're a little bit closer to the Rodeo Chesky uh, conditions of 2002. It has also been exacerbated a little bit by the uh, amount of moisture that we received last year. We had what we called a double monsoon. Last year we had very good monsoon rains and we've had good grass growth. So we not only have the fuels that have been building up for the past uh, 100 uh, years or so since we've excluded fire from the national forest, we also have uh, the grasses that uh, have grown since last summer. And we have also got a situation since 1997, we went into a drought here in the White Mountains. And that drought has uh, stressed out our trees, dried out the fuels, and uh, it makes any time that we have a, a, even a short drought, it also is cumulative type of drought, so it makes our fiber behavior even worse uh, during the height of the fire season. And then the winds don't help either. Also, the winds also continue to dry things out. Uh, here today, we had a, a skiff of snow in the across the area. Most of that has melted off. It's it's will level out our fire behavior, our fire danger for a, a few days. But uh, uh, in a, in a week or so, if we get another front moving through here, it'll dry out that little bit of moisture that we had. So, uh, if we continue to have rains or moisture every week or so or every two weeks, it might help level out the, like I say, the, the fire danger. But if we don't get that, it's going to get uh, very extreme. And we think it's going to be uh, an above normal fire danger season, even if we continue to get these little moisture bouts because we know May and June is always very dry. And and all, and people need to understand that all of that what what you know rain does the little bit amount it is is right. bias maybe a day or a couple days. It, it, it buys us maybe a week if we're lucky. If we're lucky, if the wind doesn't blow. And it grows more grass. Yeah. To burn. <laughs> right. you know, so. it, it can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, um, uh, before we had talked, Mary had brought something up that was kind of neat about um, the uh, uh, what markings on the trees. Um, there's. Right, if you come up 260, you go through Forest Lakes, um, people coming up or even people going down see the orange stripes around the trees or the, the blue stripes or the lines. Right. I just wondered what did those mean? Those are, those are uh, designations uh, where we've got a lot of work going across the, the National Forest here and it's all tied to forest restoration work and reducing the, the risk of catastrophic fires. Generally speaking, the orange marks are trees that are to be retained in a certain diameter class, a certain size of tree. Those are the leaf trees. If you see the blue marks, there, there's also a prescription that is written up that those blue mark trees are usually the trees that are to be cut, but there's, there might be a, a, a diameter uh, 
not restriction, but at, at a certain size of trees will also be cut out with a, it's called a uh, diameter by description type of prescription for removal of trees or uh, the vegetation treatment. Okay, and yeah. then that's something that, how you guys actually manage the forest, that's right. one of the things that you guys right. do. Right. And then you also do the prescribed burns along with that. Correct. And um, how, how was your prescribed burn year this year? I mean, without the snow, I mean, did it cause any issues? Or? Uh, no, not really. We basically concentrated here on the Lakeside District. We had a lot of piles left over from the White Mountain Stewardship contract. They, for a time period, they have been taking uh, material into uh, what is the biomass plant down by the old paper mill in, in Snowflake. A time period that shut down and then they didn't have agreements with it. So they left a lot of piles out there that normally would have went to that biomass plant. They have since started back up and are taking piles for that. But we, we had a lot of uh, uh, piles that were left over from what we call the White Mountain Stewardship Contract, which is the, the limbs and the needles and that stuff that they did not utilize for making uh, pellets and stuff here at uh, like Forest Energy. So okay. we had to concentrate on getting rid of those piles because those can be a little bit more of a problem during fire season, the big concentration of piles. So we, we try to get rid of those and that's what our main job with burning was, which is also prescribed fire. But uh, we put a lot of effort into that this winter. And now I know one of the questions that a lot of people usually have is um, the reservation forest and our forest, why is, are they allowed to go through and they can, their forest looks really nice and there's some areas in here and uh, you know off the reservation where people are concerned and why are they allowed to do whatever they want with their land but we can't um, manage our, our land? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting observation. I, I know some people have come up with that offer observation but they're just looking in specific areas. Areas. Um, the reservation hasn't cut a stick since 2010. They just recently started up their sawmill. Uh, we have been uh, treating uh, probably up to around 80,000 acres now since the inception of the White Mountain Stewardship Contract, and that's spread across the forest. Mm -hmm. You know, Alpine Nutrioso, we all know the story there. They saved basically those communities by the White Mountain Stewardship Contract and the treatments that were done around those communities. Um, we have been hitting the area around Pine Top and Lakeside very heavily here with those contracts. And we've also been doing a lot of stuff here south of Sholo. Since the, the Rodeo Chattisky fire, we did a lot of work out there before the Rodeo Chattisky fire. But since the Rodeo Chattisky fire, we've burned almost I would say 80 percent of the land west of Highway 60. We've had uh, ground fires there. We've went in with some uh, what we call mastication contracts where they've went in and brought in a, a big a machine that just shreds all the small diameter trees and stuff and uh, reduces that fire hazard and we have s several thinning contracts that have been in that area. We have not treated the stuff right along the highway because we can respond to the highway pretty fast and put a fire out. The stuff that's off of the highway that it's harder to get into, that's where we have concentrated our treatments. And that makes if sense. If you go back into those areas, you'll see the treatments that have been done. We haven't done a perfect job out there. We still got some stuff uh, on the east side of the highway that we've, we've thinned quite a bit of that and we've chipped that also because that's always been a concern. So a lot of that was thinning and chipping because of the issue with smokes, with smoke in the uh, show low area. But we have done some prescribed burning around summer pines and back over in behind Fawn Brook, but uh, not nearly as much as what we'd like to. At this time, we do have another environmental analysis set up. We have a contract that is set up and uh, the contractor is a supplier for material into Novo Power, the biomass plant at uh, uh, Snowflake. And uh, they started in on that contract back this fall and winter. They've done, uh, they've completed about 10% uh, of that contract. Um, but they also have other contracts working that they're working on right now that have terminate, termination dates that they have to meet. So they've left out of that. But once they come in back in the Sholo South, um, that area is going to be 
uh, a big change. Uh, some people will not like it because it's probably cut too heavy, but uh, it will more mimic what the uh, conditions were pre-settlement and it will uh, sustain fire much easier to where it won't be a catastrophic type of fire. There'll still be fires out in that area, but they'll stay on the ground and we'll be able to control them when we need to control them during the fire season. You know, um, and, and taking care of our forests and having uh, a, a healthy forest will allow us, our vacationers coming up here, to actually enjoy the forest and the people who live here to not be so worried about everything. And, and because the logging industry, I mean, is that one of the major issues that happened? The logging industry stopped, and once they stopped, our forests started flourishing and not, you know, besides the fact that we didn't allow, you know, fire to burn, right. but um, it started flourishing and it got us into the trouble that Ex we are today. Exactly. We have always used the timber industry to mimic well, the timber sales, whether it be a timber sale, a pulpwood sale, or a thinning. Those were methods that we used to mimic what fire used to do. Fire, natural fire used to control the amount of fuels in the forest. And that's how this ecosystem evolved. So we started using the timber industry and pulp mills and thinning to do that for us. There in the 90s when that was basically all shutting down, we lost the timber industry. The paper mill decided to go 100% recycling so we no longer cut the pulp wood off of it. And then that also dried up the money that we received from timber sales that we used to do the thinning and to do the broadcast burning because we did the broadcast burnings in the fall when there wasn't such a risk. And that is a domino effect. And now what exactly. we have to do in, in talking to you, Mary, is we had to bring in an or a fire ordinance now because, I mean, how long, have, how many years have we had a fire ordinance? I think the fire ordinance that I'm aware of was 2005. Um, and it started out, we were either in restriction or we weren't. And so it made it a little difficult. We didn't mirror what Forest Service did. They had stages, different stages of severity. And the counties, both Apache and Navajo, were either in restriction or not. So the purpose of the White Mountain Fire Restrictions Working Group was to take a look at all those different restrictions and see if we could come up with something that made sense. And so between all of us, we now have a restriction that has levels, stages. So we can go into stage one restrictions, which do allow people to have campfires and barbecues as long as they're gonna be responsible and they don't walk away from them and leave them burning. And they also have to be in, uh, in on the forest, they have to be in designated campgrounds that we are allowing them to have campfires. In our dispersed camping areas, We know we do not allow campfires in stage one restrictions. So, and that's basically the way the county and the city, you can do it in your backyard and stuff, but you can't do it out, out in the, in the uh, forest, so to speak. Now, who, who decides the stages that we're in? Actually, the Forest Service does, does say when they're going to go in. But what we did with the uh, White Mountain Fire Restrictions Working Group is it's a group of, um, interagency cooperators, it's the fire departments, it's the police departments, sheriff, emergency managers from both Apache and Navajo County and the Forest Service. We get together on a weekly teleconference, listen to conditions of the forest, how bad things are, how good things are, um, what its special events might drive going into restrictions. Um, some of the things that the Forest Service looks at is what's the availability of resources. You know, could they fight a fire if something did happen based on what resources are available? So all those things kind of come into play when we talk about going into restrictions. And that, that brings up something I was in an emergency management meeting down in Phoenix the other day that this guy brought up, um, that California is not doing very well this year for their fire season. And because they were saying something about their fire season will be earlier than us, they'll take most of those resources before we have the opportunity to get exactly. them because we have that's, a later fire yeah. season. That's, that's part of the equation of, of when we go into restrictions and what restriction level we go to is the resources that we have and the number of fires that we have here in the region and throughout the nation and stuff. And that affects the resources that are available to come in. Now, you had brought up campfires, and I know that's been really frustrating. You guys deal with, right now, you've dealt with a couple campfires that were left unintended. Yeah. You know, actually, our, they really aren't campfires. They aren't people out there camping. Okay. It's what we designate as party fires. 
is people go out and they uh, have a little uh, get together with folks uh, and uh, nobody will stay around to be the last person there to put the fire out. They all leave uh, at uh, certain times mm -hmm. and it, it's not camping. It's not that no. type of recreation. It's a shindig with irresponsible people. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's too bad. <laughs> Go out there, send the fire department, uh, hit him with the hose. <laughs> I will say on the Black Mesa district over to the west in that recreation area, they have a lot of, uh, of campers come in with the lakes and stuff that they have around there. And they have uh, been picking up a lot of uh, unattended campfires that people have left going when they went back down to the valley. But ours around here, are there, it's our locals that are creating the problem. Not, they need to knock it off. <laughs> um, now, with the fire ordinance, I know there was a couple changes. I mean, you know, every year you have an AAR and you see what was good, what could be changed, what could we make better. And there was a, a definitions were changed, um, help people understand. Right. One of, one of the big things that people talk about is red flag. And people really misunderstand what red flag is. And red flag has a number of uh, different factors, too. But it's actually determined by NOAA, which is do National Ocean uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric. I, I call it because it's simpler in the National Weather Service. I okay, NOAA, so. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they're the ones that determine red flag, and it's based on wind speeds and, and humidities, low humidities. And there's a lot of factors that go into it to call it red flag. A lot of people, when the winds are high, will say, oh, it's a red flag day. And that's not necessarily true. But we don't want people out there burning when the winds are whipping up there, too, because it'll send those embers um, for miles. When yeah. they talked about recently, that was a question right. that was brought up at the yeah. city, too. Uh, the red flag program was instituted to give awareness to the public that if a fire starts with the conditions that we have, designated what you were talking about, relative humidity below 15%, sustained winds above 20 miles per hour, and that's at tree top of the level, that's not at eye level, that's up okay. above so it's not protected. And then we have a high fire adjective rating, those three factors. Um, on days that we have those factors, a, a fire gets started in the, in the wrong place at the wrong time of day, it could be a fire that could not be controlled, okay? Now, it, people don't realize that if, if the wind's blowing 30 miles an hour and we've got 40% relative humidity, that's not gonna be a big deal. You don't want people burning in the community no. and stuff when it's blowing like that, but we're probably gonna be able to catch a fire if one starts. Well, but if it gets below 15%, the fire behavior climbs way up here where it's going to be possibly catastrophic. And, and that's, that's the that's, whole idea behind the red flag. Well, it's also mentioned, though, in, in the um, burn permits that burn permits actually at uh, counties and right. cities do say at anything over 10 miles right. an hour, you can't burn in certain times. And, so that, and that's totally that. different, right? Y yeah, then they can right. have that. But from a National Weather Service, that's how right. they do it. Right. Now, it's a fire behavior. Uh, warning is basically what it is. Now, the fire departments, it's not very understandable. They don't want people to burn when it's more than 10 miles per hour. Oh, yeah. Definitely but not. once you hit that threshold of 20 miles per hour with those conditions, things will uh, increase in, in, in fire behavior, you know, 10 times. And, you know, the, the designation there, um, Navajo County, like the different fire districts around, has a delegation of authority from ADEQ that we can issue burn permits. And there's a whole list of things you can and cannot do. One of them being, before you light your fire, you have to call the fire district in your area to get an okay that the wind isn't kicked up, it's not red flag, there's no issue. And that is, comes from guidance from ADEQ. Okay, now with, with the fire ordinance as well, there was a, some things that were, that might have upset people last time that were taken out this time? I don't think it was taken out, it was so much just not, not clear and not identified and okay. that was the barbecues and the, the campfires and stage one level restrictions, the clarification and the definitions of red flag, um, also the, in the prohibitions or, or even like in stage three, what you can't do. That uh, it was assumed you just can't light anything, but it didn't say that. 
So we made sure that that language was in there. So if you read through it, it's hopefully it's a little more understandable. But like you mentioned, we'll have an after action review after this fire season to see if there is anything else that we need to do. Now, if somebody, uh, how do people get this fire ordinance? I mean, I know the county has it on their website. The, the fire ordinance is posted on the website. We've been talking it up at all the different community meetings that we've been doing for the Ready, Set, Go. Um, and they can also go on the emergency management um, webpage at Navajo County. I believe Apache County has it listed there as well on their website. And then they're all kind of basically the same Apache counties compared to Navajo counties? Um, there's some slight differences, but overall the stages and that were, were pretty well in sync. Okay. I, w I would like to bring up one thing on that. We, we are pretty much consistent now with the stage one and stage two. Navajo County, that goes to stage three. We no longer have a stage three or four in the National Forest. Is what we start going into after stage two, when things warm up, dry out even more, we'll go into area closures, is what we do. And normally here on the Lakeside District, the area south of Sholo here from Wagon Wheel, all the way across south of Highway 260, all the way across our district boundary to the Clay Springs area, we will go into, and that's part of the old Rodeo Cheskai area, we will go into an area closure once things get dry enough. We also include in that the Timber Mesa area with Porter Mountain, the communication site. And then as things continue to ramp up, we'll close stuff out by Vernon, uh, you know, different places of the forest. Other districts will be uh, doing area closures. But we do take those very seriously. And we do those when we absolutely have to once the hazard and the risk is there to the public. And we, and we don't call ours closure. We changed the language there this year to say extreme fire danger. That means things right. are so dry that, you know, basically all the things you could do in stage one and two, you just can't do it anymore. So how are people going to find out if there's a closure? How are they going to find out what stage they are in? How, that, how is that information getting to them? Well, that, that's an interesting, the state, um, and uh, it's updated by Carrie Dennett, at the state level, there is um, fire restrictions. Us. We'll put that on after this. Okay. Too. Yeah. Put the website, but you can go to that website, and anybody that's in restriction, whether it's the counties, it could be BIA, they will list those restrictions, and we'll also have a link on the website, on the emergency management page that you click on that, you go to the county and you'll see who's in restrictions. It's really slick. And they started that up, I think it was last year or the year before, and they've gotten progressively better each year. So people have to go and find the restrictions. It's not like the information's gonna be out on the radio or anything? It's, it is on the radio. Okay. It, during the restrictions, we'll get press releases out. We'll, we'll be on the radio. There'll be PSAs on the radio. Um, we, go, we do take it serious as far as going into restrictions because it does mean people are limited or we're, re we're restricting what they can do. So we really want to get the word out and one of the ways we do that too is through the 311info.net or the 311 and I'm sure you'll put that. Yes. <laughs> They'll flash the phone numbers there. But from a Verizon or a cell one phone, dial 311 and we'll have information. The Forest Service has voice recorded information and we'll also have information. Now, what, can reverse 911 give that information as well? The reverse 911 is more used for an emergency situation if we had to do an evacuation or more um, timely emergency. So that we don't use to just put public information. Okay. It's more the 311 or posting on our website. Now, reverse 911, is that a text that's sent out or is this a call? It's a call and people can go to Navajo County website and register to the reverse 911 in the event of an evacuation or an emergency that we wanted to notify people in a geographic area. If they have registered on that portal, they'll get a phone call if we, if we engage that system. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. That's a lot of information to get out in a show. I mean, and I know we didn't get to everything that we wanted to. Yeah, I still got other things. <laughs> I know. I Another know show. And I'm thinking next time maybe I should just have Dave by himself. <laughs> because you do. You have a lot of vital information. It's very important. Just real quickly, if we have time, I want to say restrictions and closures, they work. They're very effective. But the thing that's really the most effective is treatments. 
treatments on the forest and treatments around your property. You need everybody needs to take their own responsibility and take care of their property. Uh, if they do everything right, there's usually not going to be any problems. Okay. Yeah. If we get everything done on the forest we want to get done, I don't think we're, we'll see a catastrophic fire. But until that is done, and until treatment is done around in the community and around people's homes, we've got that risk. Mm -hmm. But we can we can get above that risk if if everything is done right. And we're working towards that with right. this. And that's, that that is even better. There's a false sense of security with restrictions and closures because during the rodeo Jetta Sky fire, guess what? The reservation was closed. The forest was closed. We were under stage two and three, four restrictions. We had everything locked down. And we still had those fires. Well, Dave, thank you for that. And that was a good closing. I don't have to close now. And Mary, <laughs> thank you for coming out. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks and for having us. We'll see you next time. This episode of Safe and Sound was sponsored by Ladies' Day, LLC.